it, go to the description box and click the link to check out Kurt's page to get his ebook. And also, I'll have a link for Kurt's channel, which is relevant today because we are covering insulin, a big ass insulin series. And what we're going to do to drive you nuts is to do it like the CW does. And then we'll be like episode one will be on that, see. this channel. And then, yeah, because it'll be like, then the story will start in a flash. And then the next episode will be on Green Arrow. And then the next episode will be on Supergirl. And then the next episode will be on Legends that never, never of the future, whatever that show suck. And then the next episode will be in Constantine. So it'll be like a crossover. It'll be like episode one will be with me. Episode two will be with Kurt. Episode three will be with me. Episode four, four will be with Kurt. And it'll be both of us. It'll just be, it'll be both of us. And what I'm going to do now is pull up the list of the topics that we're going to cover in this series. And then we can try to make this organized in some way. So we got insulin, the anabolic effect, fat loss effect, endogenous insulin, exogenous insulin, insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, berberine, metformin, semaglutide, which is a GLP-1 and GLP, GIP, humalog versus humulin versus lantus. Those are like all the different subtopics. Um, how do you think we should organize this? I would think the logical thing is go insulin, what's endogenous insulin, what's exogenous insulin. Sure, and what the anabolic effect and then, is. And then so. probably, I mean, we could do then um, anabolic and fat loss effects, or sure. we could go to resistance sensitivity and then berberine and metformin and then follow up with the anabolic effect and the fat loss effect and then wrap it up with specific insulins like Humalog, Humalin, Atlantis. I think that's almost a video by itself. And then the final episode will probably be the semaglutide and the GLP-1 GIP, the little peptides that are not insulin, but they're insulin-like peptides. And the final episode could be IGF-1, which is going to be like kind of like, you know, and we'll have section headers so that it actually makes sense. But, and based on what we talk about is what I'll make the section header for each video. So do you want to, what do you think we should do? Go insulin and then go right yeah. into the endogenous insulin. Start yeah. with endogenous insulin yeah. and see how far we get. What kind of time are we working with here? I know we got off to a late no, start because no, my computer whatever. decided to update. It's 630 right now. Whatever. Do you want to record two? You want to do one for me, one for you? Yeah, that works. So this first episode, or, obviously, since before. It's well, for you. Oh, when I, I forgot to do the warning. Hold on. Let me do the bullshit. Warning. This is not medical advice. This is just for fun, kids. Don't try this at home. That although Kurt and I are doctors, we're not your doctors, but we could be. Click our links in the description box for help with your needs. In my case, I can do your medical stuff and coaching. Kurt also does coaching. I can order your blood work. I can read your blood work. I can prescribe medication if you live in Florida. If Flor um, And Kurt will also go over your blood work and come up with the right strategies for you. If one of us are stumped, we usually ask the other one what each other thinks. So we're both great. Um, I also do programming and nutrition with my partner, Dr. Karina Dodson. And Kurt does that as well. So you can click our links in the description box to check out which one of us is right for you. I strongly encourage you to pick one of us, though, because we're extra smart and we're really nice. All right. With that being said, I think that covers the warning that don't. this is just for fun. This is just entertainment purposes. Also, you should like, subscribe, and click the bell. And share the shit out of this with people who think they know about insulin because they're going to learn something. I don't care who you are. I'm going to learn something today. Kurt might learn something today. We, if we're going to learn something, then there's a pretty good chance you're going to learn something and everyone you know will learn something. So with that being said, let's get on with the show. So Kurt, Kurt Reno, 
Tell me about endogenous insulin. Okay. And so just to preface this, I've kind of avoided the insulin topic for a while. We've been asked a lot. Um, me too. It's for two reasons. One, it's a massive undertaking. That's why it's going to take us a lot of videos. And two, I'm hesitant for people to use it when they don't know what they're doing, right? Because it's one of those things that could be dangerous if it's not used correctly in a supervised manner. So I, I'm, I'm not endorsing the use of exogenous insulin. I'm just going to put that out there. Right. If you don't know how to use I don't it, think I, you use it. I don't think I've ever prescribed. I don't think I've ever prescribed it. And I don't think I've ever help, had a client use it. It's because it is something that is so. When people struggle with stuff, like they tell me how many milliliters that they use, like how much test you're using. I use a half a CC every other day. I'm like, this person will never be able to use insulin. That anybody who thinks like that is not capable of surviving insulin. That you have to be a math wizard and you have to be ultra disciplined and ultra responsible. And if somebody can't eat their diet perfect for a year without mistake, then I'm pretty sure they die if they use insulin. If someone's got anxiety, I figure they're going to freak the fuck out and they're going to overcorrect and blast sugar. If they start to go with little, all the people I know with who tell me they're hypo, when they test their blood sugar, it's like 85. And it's like, yeah, you're not hypo. You're just not used to being hungry. You know? Yeah. So um, it's just a very responsible only thing. And if you're not a professional athlete, if your life or job doesn't depend on using insulin, it's not worth it to fuck with it, no. especially at the U.S. prices. No. And I think um, the other thing is most guys probably haven't gotten to any sort of growth limit right outside of the pro level where it's really required, right? I, their food is off, their training's off, their gear's off. Something else is off generally before insulin is required unless you're really that big and you require that much food to maintain that size, right? Mm -hmm. and well, since just, we're already I, I'm always, has, I don't think most guys, most guys that I encounter outside of IFBB pros generally don't need it. So it's funny because we're kind of approaching this from the top down approach by accident rather than the bottom up approach. So since we're on this, Let's just do it in the order that people want it, which is anabolic effect. Sure. And you want to how I mean, we can. We can just summarize what it is really fast. I mean, it really, okay. without getting complicated, right? I mean, it's a peptide hormone that's secreted mm -hmm. by the beta cells in the pancreas in response yep. to food, right? Namely glucose, mm -hmm. protein. So glucose. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. So sure. I'm Tom Schlitten's commer and I'm eating some food, right? And it goes in my mouth. And amylase is released by my mouth. It starts breaking down the carbohydrate right off the bat. It gets into my bloodstream. What's the cascade? When does GIP get released? When does GLP get released? Does the glucose have to bind to the GL um, GLUT1 transporter on the pancreas before the insulin is released? Or does the GIP trigger a little bit of, gins of insulin release without... I never really understood exactly the cascade chronologically of what happens. It should be the GLUT1 on the on the pancreas. And then that that then insulin will in turn stimulate GLUT4 translocation on the other right. cell membranes. Um, why don't we save the GIP and GLP stuff for when we get into okay. like Ozempic and stuff? Because I feel right. like that's going to go off on like a... A real big tangent. Okay. Right? And I don't so, know if that's so related for a bodybuilder. All right. So basically my understanding is the, the glute transporters are enumerated with mm -hmm. sensitivity. Yep. So the most sensitive glute transporter is G is glute one. And that's on mm -hmm. the pancreas. Cause then first the sugar hits the bloodstream, yep. the sugar then goes, it's circulating. It binds more to the pancreas so that insulin's released. Yep. Then the insulin can bind to the brain, the kidneys, the muscle, and the fat and stimulate their respective transporters. And yep. the order that they go is brain is GLUT2, yep. kidney is GLUT3, muscle and fat are GLUT4, I believe. Four. Yep. Is is that correct? And then there's some crossover too, right? Okay. But yes, yes. So, and the one that we are primary concerned with, you and I and bodybuilders, would be GLUT4, right? So primary, right. When we're talking about GLUT receptors, it's GLUT4 that matters for us. I've got a funny story for you. Yeah. So. I was first developing my intra-workout battle mead 
and I okay. put so many glucose disposal agents in it that I had a hundred pound bikini girl who t- tried it before it was released and she didn't eat all day. So she in- intentionally didn't follow the directions, I guess. I don't really get it. And then she passed out when she was working out because I created so much of a sensitivity for the muscle cells that the muscle cells glut four transporter had higher sensitivity than the glute 2 transporters in the brain so the blood was the 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 brain was not absorbing the glucose as fast as the muscles were and the muscles sucked all the carbs out of the bloodstream and the brain didn't get enough and she fainted so i had to cut the dose into a quarter and then spread it out over so many scoops so that people would be less likely to take the full amount yeah uh, I was just going to bring up one other thing about the secretion as well, too. We don't, and we don't need to go in depth about it because I don't know how relevant it is. But pancre- um, the pancreas releases insulin in basically two different phases, right? Like you have, there's an initial burst that comes out within 10 minutes when it senses glucose, like we talked about. And then there's a second burst that will, it will continue to happen until blood sugar comes down into the range that your body's looking for, right? Where I that's see. typically from carbohydrates, right? That's called a biphasic release. And mm-hmm. protein causes a monophasic insulin release. So if you drink whey protein, it causes an insulin response, that initial one, but it doesn't get a second one because there's no glucose there. So it's not going to, it's not, your, your pancreas isn't going to continually pump out insulin for no reason at that point, but it's going to get an initial burst and then glucagon is going to come out to then kind of stabilize it. Well, it's interesting you brought that up because the study showed that 30 grams or 20 grams of whey protein post-workout stimulated enough insulin to get the full anabolic effect Mm -hmm. and adding carbohydrates didn't actually augment that effect. Or there was a study that was 30 grams of carbohydrates post-workout stimulated the anti-catabolic effect, but not the mTOR activation effect, but the AKT was activated by the insulin, I believe. So, so you still got an anabolic cascade that ended, and I believe the mTOR triggers AKT or AKT mm-hmm. triggers mTOR. So no, it doesn't matter which MTOR's pathway first. you activate. It's mTOR uh, first. At least in that, if you're hitting it that way, if from underneath it could go, you can hit it, you can simulate mTOR other ways, but the standard right. way, you're talking about with protein at the top. Um, yeah. I think what would be lost though, should, yeah, whey protein isolate could cause enough insulin response to be so-called anabolic, but what you'd be missing is glycogen replacement, right? So you're not really going to grow. So, and again, that's, I think Paul and I were going to do a video one of these days on more like protein synthesis, like in depth. I just did a post on this about the two phases Mm. of protein synthesis, because I think this is misunderstood. That would just be that initial stage, right? It's really the second stage that actually is causing muscle growth. Right. When you have satellite cell proliferation and stuff, that's really what's occurring. That doesn't occur immediately. That could take days. No, of Um, course not. Because that's your MGF mediated, prostaglandin E2 mediated, estrogen alpha and beta mediated, and yeah, and GH injection into localized tissue mediated. That the androgen receptor isn't totally involved in that. It's involved in the hypertrophy, but not in the um, satellite cell migration and donation of a nucleus. So, yeah, so it's I guess similar to the, that insulin response though too, right? So you have that biphasic right. from glucose, but you're missing out on just because it's anabolic, the release of insulin from the protein doesn't mean it's actually going to cause muscle growth, right? I think people mis- misunderstand the anabolism, right? You can simulate mTOR all day long. It doesn't mean you can grow any muscle. As lo- but if you have all 26 amino acids present and you're in a calorie surplus, yeah, assuming well, you a, simulated yeah, the tissue, other, yes. then you should get Okay, so you yeah. got a, yeah. So you got a pump, whether that's direct or it's a proxy to the mechanical tension that induced the pump, and the mechanical tension triggered the MGF pathway, mm-hmm. and your post workout because we're talking about post workout whey shakes, not just arbitrarily drinking whey shakes just to trigger mTOR. Correct. Yes. Then this environment for up to th- seventy two hours after training, <laughs> you, you could in a calorie surplus. Okay, so based on that, what I what I was getting at was. If you had the whey shake without carbohydrate 
post-workout that had you assumedly had a slower digesting chicken and rice meal pre-workout, then you don't necessarily need the post-workout yes. carbs right. yep. because you're still digesting the rice from the pre-workout. And now you've got enough insulin from your way post-workout. In theory, the post-workout window You'll absorb whatever carbohydrates you're still digesting. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have HCBG, HCBD intra-workout because that's even more anti-catabolic than having a post-workout is to have EAAs yep, and um, what do you call it? Uh, HCBDs in the workout. Correct. But if one, for whatever reason, didn't want to use any carbs on their diet whatsoever let's say they're they're doing a cutting phase for a show and they're down to zero carbs slamming away post workout should be enough of an insulin spike Indeed. to stop the catabolic effect that's a residual Indeed. from the training although i would always have my athletes have some carbs in your workout it's i would the say last um, carbs i feel like i've changed my my thought i i totally agree with you about the intro i feel like i used to think that the post-workout meal was the most important. I would almost be willing to say the pre-workout and the intro are more, and the post-workout is, right? It's needed. I think really the importance there is not the protein timing as much as it's a carbohydrate timing, right? Because GLUT4 is right. now translocated because of the insulin response and it's waiting for the glucose and you're not giving it any glucose. That's, that's the issue. Versus like, I have a lot of clients that don't seem to understand the timing of food, right? The importance of like when you plan your right. meals. And they'll basically starve themselves during the day or not eat adequate. And then they pick out later in the day. They don't get that like glue four is not necessarily ready to take on all those, all those carbs later in the day when it's right. Exercise helps that process. Right. Occur. And you know, that's kind of part of why I like up regulating glute four with cinnamon and then vandal sulfate for the liver so that it gets filled up too. And the chromium, which I know that that was controversial for a while, but I think what they did is they tested all these things individually. But if you mix them all together, our ALA and chromium and berberine and cinnamon and vandal sulfate, and then hit them with a five-fold isoleucine as well, hit them with a six-fold attack, the glute transporter transcription is increased, translation is increased, um, migration is increased. The lipid bilayer is more fluid to allow the Janus kinase receptor to fully form faster. So we get so much faster of a response to existing insulin and so much faster uptake of creatine, amino acids, and insulin and um, carbohydrates into the cell that the glucose disposal agents taken intra workout is absolutely critical. I also put um, glycerol in there so the pump's greater. Oh, cool. Yeah. So let's we talked about this let me recap for everyone so the carbs go in your mouth they start getting dis digested immediately by amylase that you start absorbing the mono and disaccharides i think through the mucosa of the mouth itself and the stomach before yep. it even gets you to wadnam you start absorbing your carbohydrates um a as, little bit mostly it's alcohol that goes through the stomach though right well but i guess Most my point is is that we get some glucose um, into the bloodstream um. And it hits your liver, it hits your pancreas, and the beta cells release insulin. So before anything else is happening, your body will start absorbing nutrition from your blood into the muscles because you have some carbs in your blood from the last time you ate. And so eating more, your body's like, okay, we got food coming down the pipe. It's not going to hit our bloodstream for another 30 minutes, but we can start using the, the carbs we've got in our bloodstream now for the muscles. And so it's going to preferentially, if you're depleted on glycogen, it's going to store glycogen in the muscles faster. If your calorie surplus and all your glycogen tanks are full in your liver and the muscle, now some carbs are going to get into your fat cells to be the glycerol backbone of your triglycerides, which are your storage unit of fat, just like glycerol is your storage unit of carbohydrates. Then your blood, your brain will start to absorb glucose. Your kidneys will start to absorb glucose. And then what's the next step? We've got the AKT pathway activated by the insulin directly. And then that starts muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein synthesis, assuming all 26 amino acids are present and you've trained and you've got 
um, a calorie surplus. Also, of course, mTOR can get activated if there's at least two grams of leucine in that protein bolus. But that's a whole nother conversation. We got to do that a different lecture. Yeah, and then there's like calcium ion gated yeah. channels and stuff that are activated, but that's not, it's going to get too deep. And I don't think that there's, it's not related per se. Well, yeah, because we're, we're supposed to talk about insulin specifically. So insulin, the way that insulin works is it binds to the Janus kinase receptor. It's called the Janus kinase receptor because there's Janus was the two-faced Roman god. Mm -hmm. So it binds to one subcomponent of it and then migrates over the other subcomponent. And once the two pieces unite, then that Janus kinase receptor triggers a cascade. I think it's probably G sub GS mediated second messenger system phosphorylation Never, cascade yep. yeah, or is it g sub i yeah it's probably phosphorylation cascade letter. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that moves on to cause transcription of dna uh -huh. translation of mrna yep. through the ribosomes which are rrna in the rough endoplasmic reticulum causes the polypeptide chain to be synthesized inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It gets transported to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, transported to the Golgi, and the Golgi sends it out to the surface of the membrane of the cell. And then that allows, that's a GLUT4 transporter, that will now allow in carbohydrates mm -hmm. and it'll allow in amino acids and creatine. And yep. that'll cause water to come with it and that causes cell swallage. Yep. And then of course the amino acids are now used for that same process of protein synthesis. If for instance, we had androgens on board, the androgens would have bound to the androgen receptor in the cytosol, migrated to the DNA, transcription, translation, um, polypeptide, primary polypeptide folding, and then trans exportation through the Golgi. The same thing. So we've got, as you see, your androgens aren't gonna work without some insulin indirectly not directly so technically insulin is going to be anabolic yes and technically because right, it's anabolism is right. building up the tissue so right so technically because it activates akt to some degree mm -hmm. it triggers this cascade similar to um leucine activating mTOR so by the same token that an amino acids are technically anabolic then technically carbs are anabolic and technically insulin's anabolic. Mm -hmm. But do you know of any actual direct anabolic effect from super physiologic insulin? Super physiologic. Yeah. So I want to grow muscle. I'm currently doing 15 units of Lantus in the morning. I'm currently using five units of Humalog pre-lifts my blood glucose is great. Is there an advantage for me going to 10 units of Humalog a day, 20 units, or doing if, 40 Lantus a day? If the food matches it, sure. Let's say the food doesn't match it. Oh, Let's say I've got well. a, a 70 to 80 glucose fasted, and I'm using a total of 20 insulin a day on 600 carbs, and I don't go up to 700 carbs. Would using more insulin without raising my carbs benefit me at all? I don't believe so. Do you okay. disagree with that? I cannot come up with a scientific explanation why people think. I don't know why it, it would. Why to me the idea is thermodynamics. Just like Justin Harris said in his Swix lecture this weekend, you match the insulin yeah. with the carbs. It's the same as a diabetic. Yeah. It needs to be looked mm -hmm. at the same as a diabetic right. would do. It's not some magic there, right? So, and someone like me that even though I'm on 12, 14 units of GH, I've got a fasting glucose of 80. Yep. I don't need to escalate right. my Insulin. Yeah. My fat, if I drop, escalate my insulin anymore, I'm going to be perpetually hypoglycemic. Yeah, that's counterproductive to training yeah. in Correct. intensity. Yeah, I don't, but I think that that happens all the time, right? Guys will take it right before and then they go hypo in the middle of the workout. That's happened to me so you'd many be times. Better, you'd be better off just not using the insulin at that point. Right. So I, I have a very good methodology for this. I start sweating. I'm cold. Yep. I can't think straight. I can't count my reps. What I do is I increase my rest period and I start double timing it on my intra-workout drink. So the, my formula for intra-workout drinks mm -hmm. is per 30, per hour of training, it's 30 ounces of fluid with 10 um, grams of EAAs and 20 
grams of cyclodextrin, cyclodextrin along with about five grams of creatine and five grams of glutamine and that's debatable but the point is this is the formula i got from karina she also has in there 300 milligrams of sodium okay so sodium 20 so in other words if i start going hypo one thing I can do is run and grab a Gatorade, pour the Gatorade in my yep. intra-workout drink, jack the carb content up by 30. And then as I start drinking, because the too. Gatorade is high fructose corn syrup, it's going to double the rate of absorption of the carbohydrates. Is it high fructose corn syrup or is it just Yeah, they changed, they, they, changed they changed it. it they changed now? it. Oh, yeah, okay. they changed it to junk. Originally, Victor Conti made the perfect rehydration formulation for the Florida Gators, and it was cane sugar. But uh, every brand of Gatorade I've looked at is high fructose corn syrup. Now. Do you want to know a funny story about high fructose corn syrup? Do you know where it came from? What's, are you talking about the informant? No. no okay. I, I was going to tell you about McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Okay. Explain it to me. So um, the, basically um, a fast food joint had trouble selling more hamburgers or apple pie Mm -hmm. dessert more french fries because people were full from drinking this gigantic soda <laughs> so they switched to a high well, they, no, they approached coca-cola and they said this is a big problem man we we're we're selling your soda but no one's buying our dessert what are you gonna do about it and they realized if they changed the ratio of fructose to glucose just mm -hmm. by two percent it leptin no longer recognized it so then your are interesting shut off so now so, all of a sudden they could drink a gigantic soda and eat an apple pie so to, for, to, to explain this to the, so sucrose, table sugar, is a polymer. It's a disaccharide, di mm -hmm. for two, saccharide for sweet, disaccharide of glucose and fructose. Yep. Glucose is a hexamer. It's usually 40, carbon 40, rate. 40, 60, is that right? Well, well normally, I think in nature, it's a 50-50. Okay. Maybe, a, I think you might be, I'm talking about um molar ratio. You're talking about probably mass ratio. Yeah. Right. Right. So molarity is a 50 to 50. Yep, you're right. Um, atomic mass is probably 60, 40, 60, 40. But, yep. So the molarity is 50 to 50. And then with high fructose corn syrup, the molarity is 55 to 45, all the way up to 10 glucose and 90 fructose. Uh -huh. And fruct fructose is an appetite stimulant. This is why um, Stan Efferding has orange juice on his vertical diet because it can stimulate appetite he also lectured at swiss you know it's a that's interesting okay yeah, so it he, he has orange juice in for like seven reasons but it's one of the reasons this stimulates appetite okay i was going the other way with it that's interesting that he's saying that because it should have an opposite effect on leptin it might that's interesting and he, he might be right i might i, could I might wrong. be misunderstanding him i okay. thought i could be wrong yeah because I've read up on um, the vertical diet six or seven times over the past few years, and maybe I misunderstood it. I, he just lectured on it a couple of days ago, but okay. because it was material that I've reviewed so many times, and his lecture was fantastic, but compared to all the doctors that lectured before him, they kind of already hit everything he covered with their own lectures. So by the time Stan was there, it was kind of, um, it's like going from, endocrinology 999 to like um nutrition 101 it, it's like it, it was almost it was we had already covered it that's the best way to put it but he covered a lot of cool stuff like cystatin c and gt he covered everything you need to know as a coach in like an hour is really cool stuff but so the point is is we're talking about high fructose corn syrup high fructose corn syrup is chemically almost identical to normal corn syrup which is just sucrose basically dissolved in water yeah. and um it's just as kurt saying just a two percent change which i did not know i didn't know it was that minor of a change it only has can in, yeah it can be a totally high stimulation of appetite yeah so basically and and there's nothing and I, i'm not a like a, i'm not a anti-seed oil guy i'm not an anti any of these things i think people are ridiculous nowadays with their fear mongering there's nothing mm -hmm. necessarily wrong with high fructose corn syrup by nature it doesn't cause disease it's not toxic it's not junk it's just another sweetener in and of itself now that being said i don't think people need to consume large quantities of it but it doesn't it's not recognized by the body in that way as far as hunger is, is concerned so the the where i'm going with the whole adding the gatorade to your intra-workout drink if you start going hypo mid-training from overdosing on humalog pre-training is that 
there's a formula you can absorb, let's say per unit time, let's call that unit time a minute, but it might be less than a minute, it might be more than a minute. There's genetic variability, the size of the person, blah, blah, blah. blah. You could, let's say you could absorb one gra one mole of glucose or one gra gram of glucose, whatever, per minute, one unit of glucose per minute. You can double the rate of carbohydrate absorption if you do two different carbohydrates. So glucose and fructose. Now it's two per minute. If you add in, I believe, salt, it goes up to three per minute. Mm. If you add in caffeine, it goes up to four per minute. This is why pre-workouts with sodium and two and an intra-workout with two carb sources, like t and HCBD, like um, Granite has uh, did that where they had two different carb sources. I use two carb sources in my intra workout. It's fructose and it's glucose. I do sucrose in the intra workout, whereas I use dextrose in the post workout. Okay. So, as the idea is, I want to uh, rapidly absorb carbohydrates as fast as possible yep. while I'm training. So, my input can match the output. Same thing with salt. I want to consume more carbs, more salt around training than any other time of day because i'm going to be sweating and i'm going to lose salt that way and the more salt you put in your water the faster you can drink the water if it's hypo what do you call it Kalemic? if it's i want to you know i'm thinking like if it's hypoosmolar i'm trying oh, to say that yeah. you want to match your blood yeah. plasma mm -hmm. with your solution you're drinking right. in concentration so that you can absorb the sodium yep. the sodium helps you absorb the water faster if if this is extra water concentrated if it's hypo osmolar it'll absorb slower than if it's yeah like if um, it were distilled water right the still water absorbs the slowest it just sits in your stomach and sloshes right. around and makes it hard to brace so having the, the right range... so i was just mm -hmm. say with the stand efforting thing it looks like it's because the fructose produces insulin and leptin and basically stops ghrelin so it's not stimulating appetite it's not blocking appetite so let's you get more carbs without blocking your appetite Similar okay. to the high fructose, I was going to say there's no. I'm not wrong about the high fructose corn syrup, but he, I would trust that Stan Efferding wouldn't make a glaring error like that. So he's not. It's just he's using the wording wrong. If that's what well, he said. I'm paraphrasing. No, no, I'm just saying so, he might have. And he also might. I, I don't know what his background is outside of being a bodybuilder. He could have just stated it wrong, or I heard him wrong. Yeah, you I would. I'm just saying. But what yeah. it's doing is it's basically it's not. It's lowering insulin levels, right? It's lowering okay. leptin, and it's suppressing ghrelin so you're not getting full if you drink orange juice you don't get full if you drank okay. you know a big glucose drink you'd be full sorry go on I with your you. so i think that covers most of endogenous insulin i aside from the janus kinase receptor now you had previously mentioned in our fat metabolism lecture that we want a soft permeable membrane so that mm -hmm. different um I, I think the term's homo dimer that different um uh, receptors that have multiple components that all have to meet together like Voltron to form what do you call it? What, the actual functional portal or yep. signaling apparatus. Because sometimes sometimes it's a port, like a hole, and the mm -hmm. thing gets stuck in the hole, and then the thing has to open up, and then it can pass through. And sometimes it's just a basket, and it's the thing sits in the Go basket, in. Yep. and then the signal gets transduced, and there's a G sub S subcomponent that... um active phosphorylates something a g a cmp becomes a cdp or ctp or whatever and it moves on i forgot the exact g sub s cascade for phosphorylation You're but there's man, i don't know that either yeah there's basically two second messenger cascades there's um g sub s which is stimulatory and g sub i inhibitory okay. and those are second messenger cascades and usually a peptide hormone, basically that just means a protein-based hormone. So it's hydrophilic. It's basically water soluble, signals the surface of the cell. And then that cell membrane receptor has a G sub S or G sub I second messenger system to tell the nucleus what it wants. Whereas with a fat soluble thing, it has to be with a chaperone molecule yeah. like SHBG for testosterone, yeah. then it can just float through through the bio, phospholipid bilayer of the membrane of the cell, just go right through the cell membrane because it's fat soluble. And then once it's in the cytosol, now it binds to a chaperone or its receptor in the cytosol. Yep. And then that translocates to the um, nucleus for DNA transcription.
Yeah, and, and not the, every and single receptor results in no, not the same transcription, person. but most hormones do, especially sex yep. hormones. The yeah. um, and the androgen receptor has a hind region, so it basically closes when an androgen binds to it mm. and gets and moves down. So it's almost like protecting it. And there's a codon, there's a set of genes there too that they just found that causes some early gene transcription that they never knew about. So there's some gene trans gene transcription that occurs before it enters the nucleus. So just the receptor itself can Yeah, so then what and what we found um I was going to do a post on danazole. Do you know about danazole? It's mm -hmm. a relatively useless steroid. It's used just for assays like this. Uh it's related to stanazole though, winstrol. So winstrol and danazole the only two drugs that really cause this early gene transcription and mm -hmm. we actually see the effects of it. So Winstrol probably doesn't enter the, the nucleus at all. It probably stays so the, it, in the subcellular fraction. So the azide ring is basically like an exoskeleton around the, mm -hmm. it's like a, a nitrogen yep. ring on, that comes out of, I believe, um, ring. Yep. C1. And I think it rebinds to C5 and it skips over C2, C3. And I think it binds again at C4. Mm -hmm. And remember, C3 is where you've got the ketone so group like a paragol, that makes it a testosterone. Ring. Right. Whereas the, you know, you I, I don't want to go into it. No, it's not necessary. I'm just explaining yeah. that. Like, we you probably saying, that's hydrophobic. We, right. Yeah. So, and then I went off on a tangent, but. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, that man, one's, cool. yeah, I know. That one's for um, Nick Falzone since he likes our tangent so much. <laughs> like, we, I got about one shit talker a month, and it's most of the time it's Nick Falzone. All right, so <laughs> let's see here. What else is there? That covers, I that think, endogenous. most of endogenous. endogenous insulin. There's probably a bunch of shit we're forgetting, but for purposes of bodybuilding, body I don't think there's anything matter. someone needs to know. No, um, it doesn't matter because all the other stuff is not really related. We could do exogenous if you want or well, do that as a I think video. We've talked about the anabolic effect of insulin in general, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk. We got some time. We if we do these yeah. thirty minute videos, there's gonna be like eleven of them. We might as well just talk about exogenous insulin really quick, mm -hmm. and then we can go into greater detail if we have to on the next yeah. video. So exogenous insulin. I've talked about Lantus and Humalog already. Then there's Humalin, which is like a normal. But in bodybuilding, we pretty much just use Lantus, and Humalog. we use. Humalog. So let's talk about what they are and how they're different from endogenous insulin. And then if we have time, we can talk about the applications of them. Sure. Well, I mean, the, on the, the basic level, you can speak more in depth about them as a drug, but on the, on the basic level, Humalog is just a fast acting, immediately available insulin that's injected to basically mm -hmm. spot treat, right? To get, to get an effect close. And Humalog, not Humalog, uh, Lantus is a long acting Mm -hmm. insulin that's given generally once a day and it'll just keep like a background almost like background noise right i don't know how else to mm -hmm. describe it you'll have you we have this constant level of insulin in the back all the time and it's kind of just supporting that instead of your pancreas doing that all the time yeah so natural insulin peaks and comes down and takes about six to eight hours i believe and so regular insulin humulin r is matching that um mm -hmm. path which is not useful for our population because we eat too many meals. If you were to shoot Humulin R with every meal, it would just mount and mount and mount and then you'd die in your sleep potentially. So what they did is they have Lantus, which comes up a little bit and stays flat. It's no other drugs like that. Everything else works off first order kinetics and it comes down in a linear decay pathway or in alcohol's zero order kinetics that it decays at the same rate, regardless of how much substrates there with Lantus it's completely different than any other drug on the planet. It's insulin. Glargan is the generic and there's different um, brands that make it. But Lantus is the one who invented it here in the U S and it comes straight and it's supposed to be straight for 24 hours. But Alex Kekel says our population chews it up so fast. It's only elevated for 12 hours. I was going to say, I always thought it was shorter than that now in practice. Yeah. So what's cool is like Ips, um, Humalog, it's called, I think, Astarte or Lispro is the generic name. It spikes and crashes, but that still takes six hours in our population, probably three hours. 
And they say that it takes 15 minutes to hit peak. But if anyone's ever shot Humalog into your muscle, not your fat cells, mm -hmm. but intramuscular, you can taste it in a second. Mm -hmm. yep. One second, you can taste it. You can taste the insulin. And when you're training and you shot too much insulin, if you did the way it, the first thing you know when you when you used Humalog, if you use too much, you start smelling the Humalog coming out of your sweat. Yep. And you're like, oh shit, I'm going to go hypo. That's when you go and get the Gatorade and add it to your intro. Is that you don't wait till you're going hypo mid workout and you're like, oh, I'm dizzy. I don't know how many reps this is. You know, like maybe it's 80. And you're like, 80 sounds like a lot. You know, like, no, you're fucked. You waited too long. As soon as you start smelling your insulin coming out of your pores, that's when you get your Gatorade into your intra. Don't drink it separate because it's not the same thing. Just augment your intra with the Gatorade. And um, let's see here. That's pretty much. There's okay. So talk to me about the protein cleavage and the C peptide and how that can be detected between the difference between synthetic insulin and endogenous insulin. Would you want to go over what, what it will do as far as metabolism first? The whole thing. Cause I was always confused. I didn't know other than using the C peptide to determine whether someone was doping with insulin whether it's okay. exogenous, because like, for instance, let me put it this way. If you ran an autopsy on somebody mm -hmm. and they had a really high insulin, you could test for C-peptide. And if they yep. had a really low insulin, someone poisoned them and killed them. Yep. That's what I, the toxicology of it. That's how in medicine that would be relevant. I don't know yeah, what else would be relevant. When you would use like a carbon 12 or carbon 13 ratio. Mm -hmm. um, but so as far as like metabolic, like what insulin does for carbohydrates, right? It's going to increase glycogen storage in muscle and fat. Right. Right. It's going to, um, sorry, I'm saying my, um, it increases the rate of glucose transport across the cell membrane, right? And th these are more apparent with exogenous than endogenous. So I wouldn't, we said before that endogenous was anabolic, but in, in the true sense of the word of really building tissue, it, it is not right. Exogenous is really what's going to be anabolic. Um, it stimulates the rate of glycogen synthesis as well, right? Okay. Where endogenous will not. Is that linear at, or uh, is it? Um, dose, yeah. So it's in other words, number. you could overdose on insulin and get more out of the carbs you're eating because you're synthesizing gluco um, glycogen faster. You could, but you'd be hypo. But you could go hypo and die. And I you people are like, you don't die if you go hypo. You I'm like, listen, if you're driving and you pass up behind the wheel, then yeah, that's where I got that one. You know, it's like is passing out while you're driving after shooting insulin because you didn't manage your carbs correctly, is you get into a car accident and you can hurt people or yourself. So yep. people you can die from overdosing on insulin. Doesn't yep. mean you die from the insulin, you no, die no, from no. the car accident yeah, exactly from the insulin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where I find it's probably most dangerous when people are asleep, right? Because they're not awake to eat. Which, yeah, but I I think it's more dangerous. Like, for instance, I have a friend who um, he was type 1 diabetic and he didn't eat anything and he passed out and he hit his head and he bled mm -hmm. enough. Ow. So I think that it's more dangerous for people who are awake and going hypoglycemic okay. than when That's they're asleep. Fine. Because most people will make glucagon and they yep. will go into gluconeogenesis and they'll save their life themselves while they're unconscious. That if you ride out yeah, your over the, hypo over the, long yeah. enough, you'll yeah, go over into the gluconeogenesis. Time, yeah. I'm slow to produce it. Like, I stay hypo for a, a period of time. So I, I'm able great. to pull myself out of it. I actually, what right. I do, if I start feeling myself going hypo, I start pulling like a, a Goku and I start trying to go Super Saiyan and I flex everything at I once. Say, and I, I and I stimulate my, yeah. I basically burn up whatever is there. Yeah, so then I kick breath. into the, glu the um, yep. glucagon production faster. Yeah, that's so, like, so oh, people just white knuckling it. People feel like they're having an anxiety <laughs> attack or they're going hypo. If you tense your muscles really hard, you kind of out. Yeah, yourself. you'll force yourself um, to go through it faster and come out the other side faster. The, uh, it's like running through the spooky forest to get to the other side of the spooky forest rather than just yep. cowering in a puddle waiting for the monsters to eat you. Yep. So it um, <laughs> it'll it'll also <laughs> inhibit the rate of gluconeogenesis in the liver, right? So in an anti catabolic way insulin will stop your body from making glucose from destroying muscle. Right. 
you thinking about it? No, I'm I'm just thinking like that contradicts what I just said though to some degree. Like me trying to squeeze the muscles enough to force gluconeogenesis. Well, you, you're out doing the no because I would say the um um I'm drawing a blank the um whatever episode. You know, there's somebody in the comments yeah. who's like this. I used to watch his channel and think Todd was smart. Now I realize he's a fucking idiot. You no, the he two doesn't have no, 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 no. Um, so. <laughs> You know that there's going to be someone who he's like 700 pounds. He looks like Pearl from Blade and his he's just no one's ever seen him. It's just like this the catecholamine. Dude. The catecholamines would be stronger than the insulin response on that one, right? They generally, okay, I see. Oh, so that's okay. what. No, so like your your tensing is going to have a stronger response i think than yeah unless you, you, like, you're stimulating adrenaline 200 basically. units of insulin um yeah. so it decreases the rate so for fat it's going to decrease the rate of liposis and adipose tissue right and lower fatty acid levels kind of the opposite of growth hormone which is ironic because that brings us to using insulin on a cut phase so okay. some people like a lot of growth Cal believes there. using a little bit of insulin pre-fasted cardio will facilitate the L-carnitine no. transporting fat into the mitochondria, and that will end up counterbalancing the antilipolytic effect of the tiny bit of insulin. I would disagree with that. Okay. Um, I think that's pure baroque science. I'm also, we don't need to go on it. I'm not a huge L-carnitine fan. It's not the oh. rate limit. In fat. It's not the rate loss. It's not the rate limit in fat burning. I'm not sure why. I understand the androgen receptor thing. That's what I was going to say. I like it for that, the androgen receptor. That's, that's yeah. more. That's more my field. The whole when it's sold, people are going to lose their fucking minds from this. When it's sold as a fat loss agent, it, I get that it's a shuttle, but fat also has other shuttles, and it is not the rate limit. Your body produces plenty of L-carnitine. Acetyl coenzyme A is the rate limit in fat burning. You can't take that as a supplement. Do you look, anyone who's ever taking a class that we learn the Krebs cycle would see that, that L-carnitine is not the rate limit. So um, I think L-carnitine has other uses, but I think injecting six cc's of it a day for fat loss is <laughs> a marketing scam at best. So I use 200 milligrams of L-carnitine before fasted cardio with my albuterol inhaler and one, a two units of GH, unless I took eight the night before, and I take my Lantus. So the idea is the little bit of Lantus will help shuttle the L-carnitine and do its job. Meanwhile, and some people say, once you've loaded your tissues with L-carnitine after months, you don't need the shuttling effect anymore. But well, it's, it's like... And, and why would you not be producing adequate amounts on your own? That's what I don't understand, where the theory came in. And then I take off 400 milligrams before I train later in the day. Okay. And then I've heard that's a good time to take it pre-trading because of the energy. But I would think that it doesn't really matter when you take it. So it's just kind of like, I'm going to stick it in the syringe with the other drugs anyway to minimize one, the shot. And I used um, Chase's brand, use code full R word for 20% off. Okay. Sorry. I'm the O'Connor tangent, but. <laughs> no, it's it's not. I mean, uh, the reason why is because this is how it tan ties back in is that we have a fat loss potentiation debate, that there is a controversial idea that insulin can potentiate a cutting phase. And, and the only I way I've ever... I've only seen one argument, that, and it's Alex Kikel saying that it can potentiate the L-carnitine. That you don't have to have carbs with L-carnitine if you inject insulin with L-carnitine. But I've also read that it's just needed for the loading phase. And once you're loaded, you don't have to worry about timing or any of that stuff. And so, Kurt, you've made your opinion clear and it makes a lot of sense. Your opinion is what my science would tell me is true. But when someone writes a whole book on L-carnitine, I assume they know more about it than me. And that's why I bought the book and read it. And it didn't make, I read, I read his insulin book. I read his GH book and I read his L-carnitine book. And a lot of the conclusions. He wrote a book on L-carnitine. Yeah, he wrote a book on L-carnitine. Okay. And so I read all of his books and I just wanted to bounce some of these ideas off of you to see what you thought of them. Although they didn't I make sense wrong. to me. I could be wrong. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me either. Once you're loaded on L-carnitine, why would it matter whether you use insulin or not? But well, I was thinking about Atlantis anyway, so I was wondering what's the difference. 
I mean, we could look up, we could do a whole video on Carnitin sometime. I, I think there's probably some should things about right. it, but I, 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 I don't know if the average person out there needs to be spending money on L carnitin injecting. It seems like a waste. Well, I don't think this is, a, you know, obviously the advanced um, discussion is for the people that are that balls deep in the science. I assume the only people who watch these and actually take these seriously are the pro level bodybuilders or the top national level bodybuilders. I would think people who are just starting their fat loss journey for the first time wouldn't watch any lecture about insulin. Well, I get, I get a lot of new guys as well. And a lot of them want to use things like that. Right. That's true. As some sort of substitute it's, for eating well cardio. Well, that's, that's the big cultural flaw is that I think if anybody walks away with anything in regards to this, lecture series about insulin is that the most important thing about insulin is that you get it from carbohydrates and if you're healthy your pancreas is going to make enough insulin to match your carbohydrate injecting insulin to grow is something you do to counteract the insulin resistance high levels of gh induce for someone who's not using gh you're never going to need insulin no. that insulin is a um, armor you wear against uh, on top of a lot of GH to prevent against the tiny amount of drawback, which is insulin resistance. And I think that's a good place to break it. Let's take this over cool. to your channel and talk okay. about insulin sensitivity, insulin cool. resistance, berberine, and metformin is a good okay. place to continue. Awesome, Thanks. Uh, all right, sweet. See all right, guys, follow us over there to Kurt's channel. Link is in the description box. Also, I'm going to share that video in our community section. So that just like I think, Kurt, you're going to be sharing all of our advanced discussions in your community section so that whether you go to my channel or his channel, you can see you all of our them. content. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Cool, I'll see you. It. So I guess send me the link to you setting up your stream. Yep, we'll do. All right. Cool. Thanks. Bye -bye.